This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service that premieres a new film every day. Is female representation in film and TV actually getting any better? Five years ago, cultural conversation around the Bechdel test reached a peak as numerous voices called for a reckoning in the overwhelmingly inadequate way women were portrayed on screen. He's a bit of a cad, actually. So my type, then. The Bechdel test itself is a fairly low bar. It demands only that a fictional work feature two women who talk to each other about something other than a man. How does it happen that four such smart women have nothing to talk about but boyfriends? But it became the focus of so much debate because even in the 2010s, a shocking number of films were failing it. In 2017, a staggering 40% of all Hollywood movies didn't pass the full three criteria. Suck it, Bechdel test. A 2014 study by 538 showed that while the proportion of passing films in Hollywood rose steadily between 1970 and the mid-90s, after that, progress stalled. So what about now? Did the Me Too era resurgence of interest and attention around the Bechdel test and female representation make a difference in what we've seen since? Before we get into the answer, it's important to note that the Bechdel test itself was introduced as kind of a joke. In 1985, cartoonist Alison Bechdel took a conversation she had with a friend and turned it into a comic strip, where she deemed it the rule. It wasn't like I ever sat down and said, this is the Bechdel test. <laughs> I decree it. Years later, the internet discovered that strip and was shook by how far we hadn't come. But just because the Bechdel test is a good indication of the problem and a starting point for looking at trends, that doesn't mean simply passing its rules equals good writing of female characters. Here's our take on where female representation is at now. If you took a cursory glance at the film and TV landscape over the past few years, you'd be forgiven for assuming that the quantity of featured female characters is higher than ever and our female representation problems are being swiftly fixed. High-profile acclaimed shows like Fleabag, Killing Eve, and I May Destroy You have dominated cultural conversations. Mainstream blockbusters like Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel, She-Hulk, and Black Widow have centered female superheroes at the box office, while established franchises have added pioneering characters characters like Star Wars' Rey, or Lashana Lynch becoming the first black female 007. Double O? Two years. Very young. High achiever. Oh, Jesus Christ. The world's moved on since you retired. And indeed, the proportion of films passing the Bechdel test has increased over the past few years, with around 60% passing in 2021. However, this statistic doesn't tell the whole story. As of 2021, men still outnumber women on screen by around 2 to 1. A whopping 85% of films had more male characters than female. And while the percentage of female protagonists in top-grossing films did increase slightly to a historical high of 31%, the percentage of female major characters Characters and females with speaking roles actually went slightly down. It's a long-standing problem that men get to do most of the talking on screen. I'll do the talking. A study from 2016 found that the top 2,500 highest grossing films in Hollywood history, actresses had the most dialogue in only 22% of them. Even in genres that feel female-centric, like romantic comedies or Disney films, men still get the majority of the lines. But if you would just listen... Not another word! We're so used to this as the normal on screen that any shift toward featuring women more in stories can be perceived by audiences as huge change. Some may see this as positive proof that things are evolving for the better, so we don't need to worry about it as much. On the other end of the spectrum, some audiences frame it as an alarming trend that's going too far. What is this? Mal, how do we kill She-Hulk? This is dark. We've seen huge backlashes to the all-female Ghostbusters, Rey in Star Wars, or more recently, She-Hulk, which seem driven by the fear that female roles are overtaking male ones. I plan on killing them off and just being the only Ghostbusters. <laughs> But this couldn't really be further from the reality. In 2014, film industry analyst Stephen Follows turned up some uncomfortable data. Films that failed the Bechdel test were consistently rated higher by critics and audiences than films that passed. In addition to reflecting cultural biases, this could also be a reflection of the money that's put into these films. Stunningly, in 2014, 538 found that the median budget of films that failed the Bechdel test was 35% higher than the medium budget of films that passed. 
Hollywood executives were intentionally funding films with worse female representation because they believed that films passing the Bechdel test performed worse, especially in international markets, even though this wasn't the case. 538's data proved passing the Bechdel test had no negative effect on a film's gross profits. Thanks to this video sponsor, Mubi, in a world where for so long so many movies have looked the same, and by that I mean they don't pass the Bechdel test, Mubi breaks the mold, curating an incredible collection of films, many of which focus on female protagonists. If you follow us, you can get 30 days of Mubi free of charge. Simply click the link in the description to start streaming. So what does Mubi have in store this month? Well, I'll be checking out the short film She Mad, Bitch Zone, an episode in artist Martine Sims' ongoing project documenting the black experience in America. This one focuses on a group of young women at camp learning about self-empowerment. It's not the only one of Sims' films on the platform this month. There's another short, Soliloquy, and her debut feature, The African Desperate, which also centers on a strong black woman. This is why I love Mubi. For so long, it's been championing women filmmakers and feminist movies that don't make the mainstream. Mubi's team of curators handpicks every film they show, and they release a new film every day, so there's always something new to discover. I'm introduced to a host of new genres, actors, directors, and writers every month. And it's always great to see a high concentration of women making a splash on screen. Click the link in the description below to get 30 days of Mubi now. Meanwhile, all this conversation about quantity overlooks the more important question of quality. And this is the biggest problem with turning the Bechdel test into a definitive measure of good representation. It doesn't take into account how well written or rich characters are. Film critic Manola Dargis tried to correct this issue when she introduced the DuVernay test in 2016, essentially a remix of the Bechdel test tailored toward people of color. It requires not only that there are at least two characters of color, but also that these characters must be complex. They can't be in a relationship together and must not exist only in relation to white characters. I'm sitting up here comfortable. Must feel good. It's about two billion people all over the world that looks like us but their lives are a lot harder. If a story's writers actively make sure it passes the Bechdel test's three rules, this isn't in itself going to lead to interesting, nuanced female characters. It's just going to ensure a form of box-checking tokenism. A female character can easily talk to another about plot exposition or technical jargon without this furthering either of the women's stories or fleshing out their character development. We can call for help? We gotta reboot the system first. That's probably worse than a story where women do mainly talk about men, but in a way that illuminates their personalities and outlooks. He'll always be there in his mind, this perfect creature that he loved for all those years. Well, perfection can get wearing after a while. The films that do and don't pass the Bechdel test don't necessarily tell a very clear picture about the female-oriented value of these stories. Examples like American Pie 2, Scary Movie, Jurassic World Dominion do pass the Bechdel test despite not really having a deep female focus. While films like Fargo, Before Sunrise, My Best Friend's Wedding, Silence of the Lambs, and Nightmare Alley don't even though they feature nuanced female characters who have agency and drive their stories. My father had become the whole world to me, and uh, when he left me, I had nothing. I was 10 years old. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and 500 Days of Summer contain feminist critiques told through a male-centric story, so they're not structured in a way that would make them pass. The same goes for relationship stories that are equally centered on the woman, like A Star is Born and A Marriage Story. So you have to be perfect, and Charlie can be a fuck up and it doesn't matter. You will always be held to a different, higher standard. Even classics like The Passion of Joan of Arc and Chantal Ackerman's feminist masterpiece, Jean Dillman, Ventois, Quitte Commerce, Mille Quatre Vins, Roussel, don't seem to fit the bill. All this leads to a strange situation where we're judging something like Wedding Crashers better than Gravity. Alison Bechtel herself has acknowledged that these rules shouldn't be applied blindly or overzealously to dismiss valuable movies. While Jackie Brown fails the Bechtel test, Bechtel called it an amazing feminist text. And when film critic Hannah Rosen criticized queer rom-com Fire Island for failing the Bechtel test, Bechtel defended the film with a corollary, saying, two men talking to each other about the female protagonist of an Alice Munro story story in a screenplay structured on a Jane Austen novel equals pass. Normally what she writes about is so domestic, you know, and then in this one she's like, here's this girl with superpowers, and it's I, crazy, like, I don't know if that's definitive. The point isn't to quibble so much over technical details as to remember the underlying important problem the Bechdel test signals, how our stories generally view women solely in relation to men, or through the eyes of men. 
This is well documented in how cinema is dominated by the male gaze and long predates cinema itself. Virginia Woolf wrote in 1929's A Room of One's Own, it was strange to think that all the great women of fiction were, until Jane Austen's day, not only seen by the other sex, but seen only in relation to the other sex, and how small a part of a woman's life is that. Meanwhile, the Center for the Study of Women in Television and Film found that there are still recognizably gendered differences in the kinds of stories that get told about men and women. Male characters' stories are more likely to revolve around work, while female characters tend to be younger, with stories that revolve more around their personal lives. And even though there's been a perception in the past few years that we're seeing a heyday for messier, unlikable female characters, like Ozark's Ruth and Wendy, Not Okay's Danny, or Mare from Mare of Easttown. Be careful what you f***ing wish for. These are outliers. Males are still more likely to get the juicy bad guy roles involved in antisocial activities like fighting or crime. All this led to Marvel writer Kelly Sue DeConnick inventing an even more simplistic version of the Bechdel test, the sexy lamp test. If you can remove a female character from your plot and replace her with a sexy lamp and your story still works, you're a hack. Obviously, female writers and directors are a lot less likely to make sexy lamps of their women characters, and our continuing lack of complex female characters with interesting interior worlds stems clearly from the dearth of female creators at the top of the industry. I definitely think there is a missing feminine voice in Hollywood in the first place. Recently, there have been huge strides made in terms of celebrating women behind the camera, with Chloe Zhao becoming the first woman of color to win the Best Director Oscar for No. Nomadland in 2021, and other high-profile directors like Celine Siama, Regina King, and Emerald Fennell rising to prominence. But the Celluloid Ceiling Report from 2021 revealed that the percentage of 2021's top 100 grossing films with female directors was at a measly 12%, down from 16% in 2020. The bias against funding films that pass the Bechdel test similarly extends to an unfounded industry fear of funding films made by women. If you hear about a film that's made by a woman, go and see it, regardless of whether you're interested or not, so that it makes some money. Because it's only money that's yeah. going to change. Only focusing on the Bechdel test and what's going on in front of the camera fails to address this deeper problem. And for that, we can look to other, perhaps more important, tests and measures. In 2014, Bath Film Festival introduced the F rating, given to films written and or directed by a woman, with a triple F rating awarded if there are significant women on screen in their own right. You sacrificed yourself for me? I love you. In 2017, 538 spoke to industry professionals to try and come up with the next Bechdel test, which would peer behind the camera. Out of that project came the Uphold test, which a movie passes if the on-set crew is 50% women, the Rees Davies test, which a movie passes if every department has two or more women, and the White test, which a movie passes if half department heads are women, half crew members are women, and half members of each department are women. Of the top 50 movies of 2016, none passed the Uphold test or the White test, and only 15 passed the Rees Davies test. Look at this trajectory. Either you have to accept that women are actually 5% as talented as men, or you have to accept that there are serious systemic issues preventing us from getting from here to there. On the bright side, the picture is getting better when it comes to TV. Between 2010 and 2020, the percentage of employed female TV writers grew from 29.3% to 45.3%. These stats are backed up by personal experiences, too. Deep Impact director Mimi Leader claims the commercial failure of her follow-up movie, Pay It Forward, led her to be put in movie jail, but had no impact on her making big TV shows like The Leftovers and The Morning Show, saying, My television career was flourishing, but I couldn't get arrested in features. It's very different for women filmmakers than it is for male filmmakers. In Frances McDormand's Oscar speech in 2018, she publicized the call for inclusion writers to be adopted on film productions. This concept, introduced by Stacey Smith, stipulates that the cast and crew of a film meet a certain level of diversity, and that the A-list actors who star in films could be doing more to push these writers through. You can ask for and or demand at least 50% diversity in not only the casting, but also the crew. Since then, high-profile creators like Paul Feig, Brie Larson, Michael B. Jordan, Ben Affleck, and Matt Damon have all committed to using these inclusion writers on future productions. Ironically, the film industry hasn't always been male-dominated. The silent era was dominated by women behind the camera in a variety of roles. 
Aliski writes, directs, and produces one of the first narrative films ever made. But as the industry became more commercially fruitful, and because the people investing were men, these women were pushed out. But while this story is pretty depressing, it can also be instructional. Industries don't have to just respond to culture, they can direct it. Introducing things like inclusion riders and ensuring a level of representation on all sides could restore a balance that's been missing for over a century. And creating a better and more diverse culture would lead to more diverse and better stories. The point isn't just making a performance of checking off boring token boxes, because when did that ever lead to an interesting story? Just make stuff that you like. I think it's going to be easier, obviously, now, especially now that we're all so pissed. <laughs> Putting a genuine variety of voices and minds into the creator's seat opens up more worlds and perspectives to us all. And that's what good storytelling is all about. Who's a voice in Hollywood that people should be listening to? Women. All of them.